ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى صراط المستقيم صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على نهجه واغتفى أثر اليوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته After praising Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala and sending salutations upon a messenger of Muhammad alayhi salatu salam to proceed. And I ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to make this a blessed gathering. And I ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. And I ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to make us from those who benefit from this gathering. And I ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to forgive our sins and to have mercy upon us. And I ask Allah Jalla fi that he guides us and he increases, increases us in guidance and he guides others through us. And I ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala just like he united us here this evening tonight that he unites us in Jannah fi dhus al-a'la. إِنَّهُ لِذَلِكَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَيْهِ أَيُّهَا الْإِخْوَةُ الْأَخَوَاتِ We are continuing the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. And we got up to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam reaching Medina last lesson. When he arrived in Medina, and we spoke about when the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, when he arrived to Medina, he first came to the south of Medina, an area called Quba or Qiba. And he was there for a number of days. And he built there the first masjid of Islam, Masjid Quba. And then after the Prophet ﷺ, he made his way to Yathrib, which is known as al Madina. And when the Prophet ﷺ, he came to Medina, he والسلام, what he did was that one of the first things he did was that he established the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Al Medina, he was on his camel, and his camel settled in a specific place. And that place that was settled in the, the camel, that was the place where the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was built in the center of Al Medina. So when the Prophet ﷺ, he started to build the Masjid, he was the one who encouraged all the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to do so because he led by example. He sallallahu alayhi wa did not wait for the companions to start building the masjid. Rather, he was the first one to start digging. He was the first one to start the work. And when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they saw that, they all rushed to help the Prophet alayhi salatu wa and to help him build the masjid. That's how his leadership was. The Prophet ﷺ was the one who was always first in doing everything. He didn't only encourage the Sahab and others to come to Khair and to rush to Khair first, but he was the one who would do it first. And then when the Sahab would see it, they would imitate him and they would feel shy. How can the Prophet ﷺ be doing this and we're not doing it? Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says that, he says that the Prophet ﷺ, he was the most courageous and brave of people. Why did Ali radiallahu anhu say that? Because he said that the Prophet ﷺ, when we were in battle, he would be the one who's right at the front. And he said, whenever we feared for our lives, we would stand behind the Prophet. ﷺ. They would use him as a shield. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't like the kings or the leaders of other times who were at the back, in the back rows, or observing from afar. Rather, he ﷺ was the first to do it, and he led by example. And the Sahaba anhum, they followed him ﷺ. When the Muhajireen and the Ansar, they came to al Madina, the Muhajireen, Allah Taala he praised Hijrah. He praised the Muhajireen. He praised their migration. And by praising them, Allah is praising this act of Al-Hijrah, the migration. Because the migration is one of the most important acts of worship that the Muslim can do. It shows a great level of sacrifice. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu who migrated from Mecca, what did they leave behind? They left behind everything. They sacrificed everything for the deen of Allah, their livelihoods, their wealth. Everything that they were familiar with, they left it behind. Even the Prophet ﷺ, when he left Mecca, it was the most beloved place to him. When he was leaving, he looked back at Mecca. And he said, Wallahi, inna ki la ahab bilad illahi ilayya, wa lawla anna qawma ki akhrujuni lama kharajt. He said, I swear by Allah, that O Mecca, you are the most beloved lands to me. And if your people, the people of Mecca, did not exile me, I never would have left. 
It was the most beloved land of the Prophet Ali and the Sahaba. But they left it and for something greater. And Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentions the reasons why they did it. And he praises them. Allah gives them tazkiyah in the Quran. He Jalla wa Ala, he says that the first trait they had, it is al-ikhlas, they did it sincerely for Allah. They weren't seeking any worldly gain. They were doing it for the pleasure of Allah, seeking the reward of Allah. Wa and that is why every act of worship is done. Sincerely for Allah. Azza wa if it's not done sincerely for Allah, Allah will not accept it, it will be rejected. Rather, it will be an evidence against Yom Al Qiyamah. In the hadith of Abu Huraira, anhu arda, the Prophet he mentioned a terrifying hadith. And everyone who hears this hadith, this, this hadith should terrify them, scare them. Abu Hurairah was approached by a tabi'i. This tabi'i, he said to Abu Hurairah, Oh Abu Hurairah, tell me a hadith that you heard directly from the Prophet and no one else heard it, you heard it directly. Then Abu Hurairah he sat up and he said, I'm going to tell you a hadith that I heard directly from the Prophet And then Abu Hurairah as he was going to narrate the hadith, he became extremely emotional and he started to cry and he could not hold back his emotion to the extent that he felt unconscious. And then he radiallahu anhu arda, he regained consciousness. And then he said again, I'm going to tell you a hadith that I heard directly from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Nobody informed me of it. I heard it directly. And he was going to narrate the hadith again, but he was overcome by emotion. And then he fell unconscious again, radiallahu anhu arda. And then a third time he regained consciousness. And then he said the same thing. I'm going to tell you a hadith that I heard from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Nobody else narrated it to me. And then with so much emotion, he radiallahu anhu arda, he said that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said, awwalu man tusa'aru bihim unnar yom al qiyamati thalath. The first people that the fire is going to be ignited with, the fire of the hellfire on the day of judgment are three. Now imagine who these three the Prophet alayhi salam are going to mention. Is he going to mention the greatest enemy of Allah Ta'ala, is he going to mention the hypocrites? Is he going to mention people like Fir'aun and Haman and Qarun? Is he going to mention people like Abu Jahl? All those who fought against the religion of Allah Is he going to mention those criminals who killed the prophets and the messengers? No. And this is why Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu was so emotional. He said that there are three categories of people who are going to be thrown into the hellfire first. And then he said, radiallahu anhu, the first is a person who had ilm, who was a qari, who was a alim. From the apparent, it looks like he's doing khair. He's engaged in righteous deeds. But what's the problem? He will be brought to Yom al Qiyamah, he'll be asked, What have you done with the blessing that I bestowed upon you? Allah will ask him. He would say, Ya Allah, there is not, there was not an opportunity to teach your religion, to teach people the Quran, except that I took the opportunity, I did it for your sake. And it will be said to him, Kadapta, you have light. Rather, you did this so that they can say, he was a qari, he was an alim, and it was said. And then he will be dragged to the hell for Ayyadim Billah. And then the second we brought, who was one who was extremely generous. He gave a lot of his wealth. They say in some of the narrations that there was not an opportunity to give in charity for the sake of Allah, يعني, from the apparent, except that this person did it. Never ever held back. It will be said to him, what have you done with the blessing that I bestowed upon you? And then he will say, Ya Allah, there was not an opportunity for me to give charity except that I did it. For your sake. And it will be said to him, Kadab, you have lied. You did it so people can say he was generous. And it was said, that's your reward. It was said in the dunya, people praise you. That's all you're going to get. Nothing in the akhirah. And then he will be dragged to the hellfire. Ya Billah. And then the third we brought, one who was courageous, who was brave, who fought in battle, and not only fought in battle, and in jihad, but he died in jihad. He'll be brought, he'll be said to him, what have you done with the blessing that I bestowed upon you? And he will say, Ya Allah, there was not an opportunity to fight for your sake, to defend your religion, except that I did it, Ya Allah. And he'll be said to him, Kadapt, you have lied. Rather, you have done this so people can say that you are brave, you are courageous, and it was said, that's all you're going to get. And then he'll be dragged to the hellfire, Iyadan Billah. As the poet, he said, وَعَالِمٌ بِعِلْمِهِ لَمْ يَعْمَلًا مُعَذَّبٌ مِنْ قَبْلِ عُبَّادِ الْوَثَنِ 
a scholar who did not act upon his knowledge is going to be punished even before the idol worshippers. Imagine, that's why Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa was so overwhelmed with emotion because of how great this matter is, ikhlas, sincerity. Without sincerity, Allah jalla fi ulah will not accept anything you do. So Allah Azza wa he praised the muhajireen, those who migrated for the sake of Allah, mukhlaseen. Wahi jalla wa ala, he says, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانَا those fuqara, those poor people, who were exiled from their homes and left behind their wealth. Look what Allah said. Ya bataguna, they are seeking fadl and the bounties of Allah Azza wa Jalla wa and the pleasure of Allah. Allah told us that their hearts are purely seeking the pleasure of Allah and the reward of Allah wa ta'ala. Wa yansuruna Allah wa rasoola. Ulaika humus sadiqoon. Allah says, and they aid Allah, they give victory to religion of Allah. And his messenger, they are the truthful ones. That's the first trait that Allah Azza wa praised them with, the muhajireen, those who migrated. Ikhlas. It's not an easy thing to do except that you're doing it for Allah Azza wa Jal. The second, it is a sabr that they had patience. And that patience is that you're restraining yourself from letting your emotions lead you to do things that are not in accordance to what Allah Azza wa Jal has legislated. Allah Azza wa Jal says, هَاجَرُوا فِي اللَّهِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا ظُلِمُوا Allah said, those who migrate for the sake of Allah, we're going to grant them in this dunya goodness. And the reward, the akhira, is greater if only they knew. Who are they? Alladina sabaru, those who are patient. And upon their Lord, they have reliance. They were patient with all the difficulty that they endured. Patient. Why? Because they are focusing on that reward that they're going to get from Allah Azza wa Jalla. That patience, Allah wa Ta'ala tells us when the act of worship that Allah Azza wa Jalla has not specified the reward for it. Why? Because the reward is so great. The patient are going to be granted their reward without any account. Also, Allah Taala praised them for their sacrifice. Wahi Jalla wa Alaihi says, "Alladina amanu, wahajaru, wajahadu fi sabir Allah bi amwalihim wa anfusihim a'zam darajatan 'end Allah wa ulaika humul faizun." Allah Taala praised them for their jihad and their tadhiya, their sacrifice. Where He said, "Those who believe and migrated." And they strive for the sake of Allah and they struggle, they did jihad fi sabirillah bi amwalihim with their wealth before their own selves, their wealth. Wa anfusihim and themselves a'zamu darajatan and Allah. They have a greater status in the sight of Allah Taala, and they are the successful. Allah Taala praised them in so many different ways. Why? Because this act of worship, hijrah, it is it shows true iman. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he told us that hijrah is not only migrating from one land to another. It's a lot broader than that. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us that part of hijrah, it is to migrate from everything that Allah has prohibited. Doing it sincerely for Allah, that is hijrah, for Allah's sake. And that is what we're required to do every single day. To abandon the matters that Allah has prohibited, has made haram. For the sake of Allah, seeking the pleasure of Allah, Jalla fi ula. The one who does that, Allah Azza wa Jalla, in his sight, he's great. We are not being asked a lot of time to do what the Sahaba radiallahu anhu did. The sacrifices that they made. And I've said it before. The Sahaba, what they endured, we are not being asked to do the same. All we are being told to do, it is to abandon our evil desires. For the sake of Allah. If you do that, Allah will be pleased with you. And that's where it all starts. So the Prophet 
and the Muhajirin Ansar when they settled in Medina. Now the Muhajirin have come to Medina. They have left behind their homes. They have left behind everything. And they come to the Ansar. The Ansar, Allah Tabarakwata described them. And what did he say about them? Allah praised them. He praised them for the way they treated these migrants. These people who have come to their land. Normally, do people like migrants or they don't like migrants? You've been seeing the news, what's been happening on the news huh? recently. Uh, what, what was the policy that the government is trying to put through? What was it called? Small boats? Small boats, right? People coming to the shores of the UK and seeking asylum. They are trying to turn them away because nobody likes migrants, apparently. That is the attitude of most nations. They don't like people who come to their country. They say they are coming and stealing our jobs and our homes and everything and taking all opportunities away from us, right? That's the attitude. But that was not the attitude of the Ansar. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he praised him, he says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانِ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجِرَ إِلَيْهِمْ Those who tabawwa'u الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانِ They have attained that iman and that home, that reward of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, being prepared for them. What about them? Allah says, يُحِبُّونَ They love those who migrate to them. They don't like others who dislike migrants, they love those who migrate to them. But is that it? No, they don't only show them love. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً They give to them. They share everything with them. Even if they're in a state of poverty themselves, they say, no, my brother needs this. He's a, if they're in dire need, they give preference to the migrants over themselves. They give preference to others over themselves. Imagine, that is Iman. The iman that they had was demonstrated in their action. They didn't just claim it. They welcomed the muhajirin because the muhajirin, they left Mecca. And what they were missing in Mecca, they didn't have in Mecca was that love. Nobody loved them. Nobody liked them. Everyone hated them. They were showed enmity and hatred. But they welcomed to Medina with love and compassion. And they were given opportunities. The muhajirin, shared, the ansar shared everything with muhajirin. They said, here's my home. Live in my home with me. They shared their meals with them. They gave them, they gave them wealth, everything. That was their attitude. That's Iman. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ established in Medina, where he established that Mu'akha, that brotherhood between the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Because when he built the Masjid, the Masjid was the center that that was going to be established in. The house of Allah wa ta'ala. And Allah wa ta'ala, he praised this center, the house of Allah, the masjid, where Allah wa ta'ala, he says, Fi buyutin, adhin Allahu an turfa'a, wa yudhkara fi hasmu, yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghudui wal asal, rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun, wa la bay'un an dhikrillah, wa iqam salati wa ita'i zaka, yakhafuna yawman, tatakallabu fihi al qulub wal absar. Allah says, in houses, the house of Allah, the masjid, that Allah has permitted, that his name is raised in it, elevated in it, the masjid. Day and night, he's glorified in it, the house of Allah, wa ta'ala. Who is glorifying Allah? Men, Allah says. That's no worldly matters, and no business distracts them from the remembrance of Allah, and the establishment of the prayer, and giving zakah. Why? Because they fear the day that their eyes and their hearts are going to flip and they're going to shift. Yom al Qiyamah. When the Muhajirin, the Ansar, the Sahaba, they heard these ayat, the masjid was their second home. But after the Prophet ﷺ paired up the Muhajirin and the Ansar, we hear about there were other people who the Ansar could not take care of. Because when Islam started to grow and people started embracing Islam in big numbers, there were people who the Ansar could not take care of anymore because of how overwhelming it became. So these people, where was their home? The masjid. These people were known as Ahlul Sufa. And they lived in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Who was responsible for them? Who was taking care of them? Muhammad ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ himself would be the one who would make sure that they're okay, make sure that they're fed, because they were poor. They migrated, they left their homes, they came to Al-Madinah, they have nowhere to go, they have nowhere to stay. So the Prophet والسلام, when someone would come to Medina, a new person, a new migrant to accept Islam, he would give him all his attention. 
When a new Muslim will come, he will give him all of his attention as the riwayat they say. Ubad ibn Samit, radiallahu anhu arda, he says that I was in al Madinah and a man came to the Prophet Ali he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have left my home, I left behind everything, I migrated for Allah and his messenger Ali salam salam. And the Prophet Ali completely left what he was doing, he focused on him, he said to me, give me, he said to him, give me a few moments. He went to Ubad ibn Samit, radiallahu anhu arda, he told him, I want you to sponsor and take care of this man. But then when that was not possible, the Sahaba had too many to take care of, then the Prophet Ali put them in the masjid. He told them to live in the masjid. And then he would tell them to go to his house, though his wives, and he would tell them to seek food from them, that they would cook for them. The Prophet Ali would not eat until they eat. Look at that. He, Ali everything he had, he would give to them. Before even his own family, Ali I mentioned to you last lesson that the Prophet Ali he had all the resources that any leader could have right in front of him. He had access to everything, wealth, everything. But the Prophet Ali lived a very humble, simple life to the extent that his own family will go on days without setting light or, or igniting fire in their, in their homes, cooking food. Why? Because the Prophet Ali he would make sure that others the Sahaba who are fuqara, who are in need, that they had something before even his, himself. And they would live on dates and water. And he didn't abandon his family, he gave them something. But they lived a simple life. They mentioned that Ahlul Sufa, they, they used to differ in number. Yani. Sometimes there would be a lot in number. But the average number of them were around 70 men. 70 men the Prophet used to take care of. And it said that other times there were more of them. Because it said that Sa'ad ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu arda, he used to feed 80 of Ahlul Sufa every single day. 80 of them. Because he was a leader of the Ansar. Every single day he used to feed 80 of Ahlul Sufa. And that was just some of them that he used to feed. Because there were others that other Sahabi used to feed and the Prophet Ali used to feed some of them as well. Look at that. The Prophet Ali did that. But one may say that this Ahlul Sufa, some people they took the people of Ahlul Sufa who lived in the masjid and they took this and they took a bad idea from it. What is this idea? That one should not work, one should stay in the masjid and just rely on others to provide for him. Because Ahlul Sufa were like that, so what's the reason for me to work? What's the point of me going out to seek rizq when others can provide for me? I'll just focus on ibadah, stay in the masjid, khalas. Does Islam encourage that? Of course not. Ahlul Sufa didn't really remain Ahlul Sufa forever. It was a temporary situation to get them on their feet. It was like the benefit system. It's to help you not stay in a, in a position of poverty. It's to help you get on your feet so that you start your life. Who's amongst the Sahaba, the most prominent Sahaba who was from Ahlul Sufa? Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu arda. Abu Huraira, did he remain from Ahlul Sufa for the rest of his life? No. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu arda, later on, he started a family, he had children, and Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu later on even became an Amir in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, he became a governor. In the time of Umar, he was the governor of Al Bahrain for a period of time. And they didn't have the mindset, this is it, this is me for the rest of my life. La. Because they knew Islam does not teach that. It was an unfortunate situation they were in for a period of time, and as soon as they could leave that situation, they did so. And that's how the Muslim is. طيب. When the Prophet والسلام, he built the masjid, the masjid was built for the salah, for the ibadah of Allah, that's the first thing. But it was also built to be the place that the Prophet Ali والسلام, he judges between people. It was built for the place, it was a place that the Prophet Ali والسلام, was educating people. It, has, it had numerous any purposes. It wasn't only a place that you would pray and you would leave. And some people they have that understanding of the masjid. The masjid is only a place that you form salah and you leave. The masjid has its haybah, it's a place that you must respect, you must venerate, because it's the house of Allah wa ta'ala. And there are certain etiquettes that one must maintain in the masjid. Amongst those etiquettes is that when he's in the house of Allah wa ta'ala, he comes here in the purest state, 
clean because this is the house of Allah the Prophet he said in the hadith that whoever has eaten garlic or onion masjidina, let him not come near our masjid why? because he said because the angels they are bothered and annoyed by what the human beings are also annoyed by the odor right? and that applies to any other odors that an individual could have at that period of time he should not come to the masjid when he's like that he should purify himself, get rid of that, then come to the masjid. Right? Because it's the house of Allah, you need to come in the best state. That's from the etiquette. From the etiquette of the masjid, it is that when you come to the house of Allah, you do not treat it like any other place. You treat it with the greatest respect. So certain things you wouldn't do in your home, certain things that you wouldn't expect people to do in your home, how can you do it in the house of Allah? Right? especially shouting and screaming and so on, it's not allowed, especially when people are worshipping and then salah. Because we are taught that when individuals is praying salah in the masjid, that you're not allowed to read Quran out loud. That's the speech of Allah. You're not allowed to read Quran out loud. Why? So that you don't distract him in his prayer. So what about you just talking and not reciting Quran? Of course, Adam min bab awla. From the etiquette of the masjid, it is that when we come to the house of Allah, we utilize our time here for ibadah more than anything else. We spend our time in ibadah more than anything else. It doesn't mean that you can't be doing anything else in the masjid, but the ibadah should be the primary thing that you focus on when in the house of Allah, because it's a place of ibadah. And that also teaches us that the, the masjid, anything that's worldly should not be done in the masjid. You should lead all worldly matters outside the masjid. The Prophet Ali Salatana, he said that it's prohibited for one to buy or sell in the masjid. It's haram. Not allowed. You're not allowed to talk about business in the masjid. You're not allowed to promote your business in the masjid. Oh, that's haram. The Prophet Ali Salatana prohibited it because it's a place of worship, not a market. Also, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that if an individual, he loses something in the masjid, and then he starts announcing, he said, I've lost, I've lost this in the masjid, that you should say, may Allah not allow you to find it. Why? Because he's treating the masjid like a market. If someone loses something, or you find something in the masjid, you give it to the imam. You give it to the imam of the masjid. And the imam of the masjid, the person who's lost something should come to him, and they ask him, has, has, has yani, my object, has it been found? And he'll give it to you. But you shouldn't be screaming the message and make an announcement. I've lost my phone. I've lost this. Has anyone seen it? La. Because then it'll have bad consequences. You'll never find it. People are going to say to you, may Allah never allow you to find it. You're in the masjid, du'as accept it. All of these are etiquettes the Prophet ﷺ taught us. But the greatest etiquette that the masjid we must have in the house of Allah, it is that when we perform salah in it, we perform the salah in it in the best manner. That salah that we're performing, the masjid was built for that salah initially, right? That salah should be performed in the best manner. That's my meeting with Allah, I perfect it. طيب, now a question. Can one uh, play in the masjid? Is that allowed? Are you allowed to play in the masjid? No? Okay. Are you allowed to joke in the masjid? No. Are you allowed to laugh in the masjid? No. Who said that? Bismillah. You are allowed to joke in the masjid. As long as the jokes does not have anything haram in it. And you're not lying. It has the guidelines of the sharia. You are allowed to laugh in the masjid. You are allowed to play in the masjid. But, all of that has conditions. Some people, they... Take that and they just apply it anywhere. La, it has conditions, it has the wa, but it has rules that must be followed. If you're joking in the house of Allah, you can joke, but as long as it does not cause any disruption or anything in the masjid when people are doing ibadah. You can joke in the masjid as long as you're not joking about something haram. You can joke in the masjid as long as you're not lying. If those etiquettes are being met, no problem. You can laugh. As long as you're not laughing so loud that everyone else is being distracted due to your laugh. You can play in the masjid because the Prophet ﷺ, he used to 
allow the Abyssinian men to play the message that he used to watch them and he never taught them off. But if it's, it only can be done when it's not the time of ibadah. If it's time of salah, am I going to go back and start playing when everyone's praying? Of course not. The whole idea is that if it's not the time of salah, it's not the time that there's ibadah going on in the masjid, nothing else is going in the masjid, then you could do these things. But if that's the case and there's ibadah going on in the masjid, you must refrain from all these things because the ibadah is the priority. You're not allowed to distract anyone from their ibadah. It's about knowing that balance. So the Prophet ﷺ, when they established the salah in the masjid, when he came to al Madina now, the salah was it already obligatory or not? When was salah obliged? In Mecca or Medina? Huh? In Mecca, when was it obliged? At the beginning or the end? At the end. At the end. Which year? Does anyone know? Which year after Prophethood? Five twenty. No, 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 not five twenty. It's <laughs> too much. <laughs> Good try, though. Huh? Which year after Prophethood was the salah made obligatory? 10th year, 9th year, 11th year, 12th year. Is that the 14th? 14th year? No, that's from your pocket. The 12th year after the Prophet, the Salah was made obligatory, right? But when the Salah was first made obligatory, you know how it was performed? It was five prayers. Fajr is two rakahs. Dhuhr was two rakahs. Asr was two rakahs. Maghrib was three rakahs. And Isha was two rakahs. That's how it was at the beginning. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina and he established Masjid Nabawi, the salawat were then completed. Those that were two were made four. Yani Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha were made four. Four rakahs each. And Fajr remained as two. And Maghrib remained as, as three. But then now the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ start to have a discussion when they finish building the Masjid. That how are we going to tell the people about the, waqt, the time of salah? How we are, are we going to inform them? So there's different ideas to have a horn like the horns of the, the Jews or to have a bell like the Christians. But the Prophet ﷺ disliked all that. He didn't like it because he disliked imitating the Jews and the Christians. So then there was an idea to call out for the Salah. To tell people, come to the Salah, that was it. So the Prophet ﷺ liked that idea. And he, radiallahu, he alayhi salatu salam, he told a number of companions to call the people to the Salah when it's time of Salah. So among those companions was a Sahabi who was Abdullah ibn Zayd al-Ansari radiallahu anhu arda. Abdullah ibn Zayd, he was amongst those who used to call to the Salah. He saw a dream one night. In that dream, he saw someone telling him, shall I teach you how to call to the Salah? Something better than what you're already saying. And then he taught him the Adhan, Allahu Akbar. Four times, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, twice, Ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, twice, Hayya ala salah, twice, Hayya ala al-falah, twice, Allahu Akbar, twice, La ilaha illallah, once. Then he told the Prophet Ali Sallallahu about his dream. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, last night I saw this dream, and the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi he told him that this is the way we're going to call to the prayer. And he told him, go teach Bilal in Rabah this dream that you saw because he has a better voice than you. He can call to the Salah. And the Bilal radiallahu anhu would call to the Salah. And before he would go on top of homes, the roof of some of the homes, to call for the Salah until the minar or the minaret of the masjid was built. And then Bilal radiallahu anhu would go on top of the minaret and would call for the Salah, the Adhan. That was how the Adhan was established. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he received it through wahi as a revelation when the Sahabi saw it in a dream. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Innaha la ru'ya haqq, that your dream, it is the truth. It's from Allah. Yani. And the Adhan was established. Now Umar radiallahu anhu, when he first heard the Adhan, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw the same call in my dream. Radiallahu anhu wa Naam. And then other Sahaba also came out. It said that a number of Sahaba saw the same dream. And they saw the Adhan in their dream. Then the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi when he had settled in Medina, he made a mithaq. He made an agreement. He made rules, legislation, that the people are going to coexist in Medina. Because in Medina, there was no only Muslims. Who else lived in Medina? Jews, right? 
So the Jews of the Prophet ﷺ made an agreement with them that they are going to live in Medina as long as they don't break this agreement. They don't side with the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ. They don't harm any of the Muslims and so on. They agreed to that. They all signed it. خلاص. Everyone's going to live in Medina in peace. When the Prophet ﷺ lived in Medina for that period of time in peace, what was going on at the same time? What was going on was that Quraysh these are all rhetorical questions, by the way. What was going on is that Quraysh, they were trying to find any way to harm the Sahaba who are in Mecca, who are in Medina, sorry. Right? And the Prophet, والسلام, he also was trying to make sure that this new state that he's established, that Quraysh do not find any way to make it collapse. So he made this, he, his focus was making the state extremely strong. And that's where the Mu'akha came in, the brotherhood between the Muhajir and Ansar, that everyone's united, everyone's one force, and they're behind their leader, whatever he says goes. And the Prophet ﷺ, he sent Saraya. Now Quraysh, what did they do to the Muslims? They exiled them from Mecca, and they took all their wealth, right? They stole from the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ, he knew there were certain caravans coming from Sham that belonged to Quraysh. He sent Saraya. Saraya are different to Ghazawat. We have Saraya and Ghazawat. These are terms used in Sirah. Saraya Sariya is a campaign that was led by the Sahaba. The Prophet ﷺ sent them out to go fight. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't go with them. It's called a Sariya. And the plural is Saraya in Arabic. And then we have Ghazwa, a battle, yani, or Ghazawat, which is the plural. And these are the actual campaigns or the battles that the Prophet ﷺ, he participated in himself. So the Prophet ﷺ sent a Sariya. And those Saraya that were sent, they were sent to go intercept these caravans that were coming from Asham to get back the wealth of the Muslims that were stolen from them, right? But each time, the Sahaba were unsuccessful and the caravans escaped. There was a number of carav caravans that escaped and it kept happening until we get to the second year after Hijrah. And the second year after Hijrah, this is when the Prophet ﷺ he knew that there was a caravan led by Abu Sufyan coming from Asham, Syria. And this caravan, it is, it has a lot of wealth and it's going to Mecca, it's going to go come through Medina. So the Prophet والسلام, he now prepared an army and he led that army and they went out to go in to, in to see that caravan, capture it. When the Prophet ﷺ was going, he made it optional for Sahaba to come. Yani it wasn't a must. Meaning that anyone who had an excuse stayed behind. So some of the Sahaba stayed behind because they had legit legitimate excuses which kept them from going. Even though they would have loved to go with the Prophet ﷺ, but they couldn't go. So the Prophet ﷺ took with him around 313 men, around that number. And they only had about two horses. The goal is to go capture that caravan. So as they're going to capture that caravan, news reaches Abu Sufyan that the Prophet Muhammad is coming to attack the caravan. So what does he do? He sends a messenger to go to Mecca, to go inform Quraysh that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is coming to steal your wealth. He's coming to capture your wealth. Do something about it. Quraysh hear it. This Messenger comes and he enters Mecca shouting, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, Adriku amwalakum, Adriku amwalakum. O oh Quraysh, O oh Quraysh, go save your money, go save your wealth. And yeah, he's trying to get their attention, it's a big deal now. So they're thinking, what's going on? So then all the leaders of Quraysh, they come out from Darul Nadwa and they hear what he has to say. And he tells them that Muhammad Ali, salam, he's going to attack the caravan that's led by Abu Sufyan. Go save your wealth. Abu Jahl, he hears that. He says, no way Muhammad is going to attack a caravan. We're going to teach him a lesson. He prepares an army. He tells all of the different tribes even around them to come join them as well. And he prepares an army of a thousand men. And they leave Mecca. They're heading towards the Prophet ﷺ. Now, until now, the Prophet ﷺ did not know that Quraysh are coming. He doesn't know yet. Until he receives news that 
Quraysh have come out with an army to face you. And he also was informed that Abu Sufyan had escaped. Abu Sufyan had escaped, the caravan had escaped, the Prophet didn't capture it. So Quraysh, when they came out, and they're coming towards the Prophet and now the Prophet he knows that now there's going to be a battle. It's inevitable, can't be avoided. What does he do? Prior to actually this happening, this is yani, important information. Prior to this happening, the Prophet ﷺ, through revelation, was informed of two things. Or he was promised one of two. Either that he's going to capture the caravan, which was the goal, or that he's going to be successful in battle. Now, the Prophet ﷺ didn't know which one was going to happen. Right? So they went out, seeking the first one, because that's easier, capture the caravan without having to fight. But the caravan had escaped. Now what does he know, Ali Salatullah? He knows that he's going to be successful in the battle. He knows that prior to anything happening. Now keep that in mind, because this is important for everything that's coming next. Because someone who knows that they're going to be victorious in the battle does not behave the way the Prophet Ali Salatullah behaved after. Because the Prophet Ali Salatullah is different. And we're going to see why. The Prophet Ali Salatullah after finding out the Quraysh are coming, he consults the Sahaba. He consults the Sahaba about what? He says to him, Ashiru Ali, you heard the news, Quraysh are coming, what do we do? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu got up. He said, Ya Rasulullah, we're going to stand by you, we're going to fight with you, we're with you. Then he sat down. Then Umar radiallahu anhu got up. He said, similar. Then Al Muqdad bin Aswad radiallahu anhu got up. He said, similar. And each time, every, every single one of them would speak, each one of them would speak, the Prophet والسلام, when they finished, he would say the same thing. Ashiru alayya ayyuhal nas. What do you think of people? Tell me what you think, give me your opinions. What should we do? Each time. So then, a sahabi known as Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, radiyallahu anhu arda, he said, ka'annaka turiduna ya Rasulullah, it is as if you intend us, O Messenger of Allah, the Ansar. Why? If you remember, before we broke up for the, for the break in the Meccan period, the Ansar, they pledged allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ, right? There was an agreement between them and the Prophet ﷺ. Amongst the conditions of the agreement was that they are going to fight to the Prophet ﷺ and defend him as long as they're within Medina. They were not obliged to do so outside of Medina. So now the Prophet ﷺ wants to see the Ansar, where do they stand? Are they on board or are they not on board? But guess what? The Prophet Ali knows that they're already going to be on board. Why is he consulting them? Showing them that they are important, that they matter, their opinions matter. That's how a true leader is. Even if he knows what the outcome is, he's still showing them that their opinions matter. This is not a dictatorship. Allah commanded him to consult the people. And consult them. Allah said to the Prophet Ali even though the Prophet Ali is also receiving wahi revelation from Allah, but Allah still commanded him, consult your companions. So he consulted them. So Sa'ad said, Ya Rasulullah, we, we believed in you. And Allah took us out from darknesses or misguidance to the light of guidance through you. And Ya Rasulullah, if you were to cross the ocean, not a single man amongst us will stay behind, we will all follow Ya Rasulullah. Go ahead, O Messenger of Allah, we're with you. And the Prophet ﷺ was pleased by that. And then, when that happened, the Prophet ﷺ, he, what he did was that he told the Sahaba that we are going to uh, come up with a strategy for this battle. So they headed towards Badr, and this is where the battle is going to take place. And then he, alayhi salatu salam, he camped in a specific place, right? He told him to stay here. One of the Sahaba got up. He asked a question. He said, Ya Rasulullah, this place that we're camping in, did Allah command you to stay here? Is it wahi revelation? Or is it a strategy from you? And is it your ijtihad, a military strategy? The Prophet ﷺ said, is my ishtihad a military tragedy for me? 
Look at the Sahaba, look at the adab and the way they ask questions. They don't question. If it's wahi, he was going to say, Sama'na wa khalas. I have no, nothing to say here. But if it's not, then he knows that because of his experience, he can contribute. He said, Ya Rasulullah, this is not a place to stay. I have a better place for us to go. And the Prophet ﷺ listened to him. The Prophet ﷺ respected people's knowledge and their experiences and so on, and he took it on board. He wasn't a leader that pretended he knew everything and didn't listen to anyone and was stubborn. La. He would listen to everyone that had something to contribute and he would take their opinions on board. So we listened to him and they took his idea and it turned out to be very, very good because of his background. Now Quraysh, they find out as they're on their way to Badr that the caravan of Abu Sufyan has escaped. So then a man known as Uthman Rabi'ah, he said, to, he said to the rest of them, if our caravan has escaped and our wealth is safe, then let's head back, there's no point of us fighting. But then Abu Jahl refused. He said, no way. We're not going to go back until we teach Muhammad and his companions a lesson. Until we teach them that they can never mess with us ever again. To show them that this is something that they can't ever dare to do ever again. So then Utbah said to Abu Jahl, that Abu Jahl, or he said to Abu Hakim, as you know him as Abu Hakim, that you have no experience. Due to your lack of experience, you are saying things like this. I'm more seen than you. I have more wisdom than you. But the majority of the people, they followed the opinion of Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl started accusing Utbah of cowardice. He said, are you afraid? So Utbah stayed with them. And they carried on. All of this is leading up to the great battle of Badr. The great battle of Badr, Al Kubra. Do you want to know what happened in Badr? Or should we save it for next week? We'll save it for next week. Huh? Or should we mention some of it now? Mm. We're not going to get into the battle, that's all next week. But I'll tell you what's going to happen before it. The Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, as he knows Quraysh are coming. What does he do? He personally goes out to go find information to find out how many of the eye number, how many horses they have, how many camels they have, and so on. And they found some men who came from the direction of Quraysh. They were, and they captured the Sahaba, captured them. And the Sahaba, they beat them. And the Prophet Alaihissalam prohibited them from beating them. He told them, don't beat them, don't harm them. And then these men, these men they refused to tell the Prophet Alaihissalam any information. So the Prophet Alaihissalam asked them one question. He asked them, how many camels they slaughter a day? And then he said that they slaughter, how many camels? Huh? The man said, how many? Ten? Ten or a hundred? A hundred, mashallah. They said that they slaughtered ten camels a day. So the Prophet ﷺ, by hearing that from them, he said to them that they are a thousand. Because they're slaughtering 10 camels a day, that means that each camel, how many people are eating it? A hundred. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ said they are a thousand. They are a thousand men. He worked it out just by that information. Without them telling him anything. And then he, alayhi salatu salam, he told them to let go of the men and not to harm them. Look at the Rahmah. These men were from Quraysh's side and they were servants of Quraysh. He told them, let them go and don't harm them in any way. And then the Prophet Ali Sallallahu prior to the battle, he, the night before, when they set up the tent of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu that whole night the Prophet Ali Sallallahu was praying to Allah making dua. He was praying to Allah making dua. What was the dua of the Prophet ﷺ that night? He was saying, Allahumma, nasraka alladhi wa'adta ibadaka al-mu'mineen. Oh Allah, grant us the victory that you have promised your believing slaves. Allahumma in tuhlak hadhi al-usabah, falan tu'abad fi al-ard. Oh Allah, if this group of people are destroyed, you shall not be worshipped on this earth. 
And he kept repeating Nasrak al-Ladhi wa'atta ibadak al-Mu'mineen And he raised his hands so high That his garment fell off his shoulders And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Walked in on the Prophet alayhi wa sallam Whilst he's making dua And he said Ya Rahim He put his garment back on his shoulders And he said Ya Rasulullah Qad alahta ala rabbik You have insisted upon your Lord And you asked Allah Allah is going to grant you what you asked for Look at this The Prophet alayhi wa sallam He knows what the outcome is going to be But look at everything he's doing prior to the battle He's making dua as if he doesn't know he's going to be successful. Why? This teaches us as believers that even when we know what the results are going to be, even, know, even when we know what's going to happen, that having that strong connection with Allah wa ta'ala, and coming with the necessary means in order to achieve your goal, it is absolutely necessary, it's part of iman. That is true reliance upon Allah wa ta'ala. And we mentioned it also last week regarding the hijrah. And now again regarding the Battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ did all the preparations necessary, all the planning, even collecting يعني, information, right, intelligence. All of that to make sure that the outcome that he was promised by Allah Taala, he achieves it. Even though they are no match for Quraysh, 300, 1000. But all of that is part of at tawakkul And that's how the believer is. That's how he relies upon Allah Taala. He exhausts himself to achieve his goal and whilst calling upon Allah and relying upon Allah and asking Allah Taala. And because dua changes qada, it changes your destiny. The Prophet Ali said, لا يرد القضاء إلا الدعاء. Nothing changes qada except dua. And that's why the Prophet Ali he would say, Waqini ma qadayt. Protect me, Allah, from the evil that you have decreed. Because by making that dua, it can change the whole destiny. Hmm? So he would say that, Ali salatu salam. But, is it just by making any dua? No, it's about the way you make dua. It's about the wording that you use. That can change destiny completely, the qadr that Allah has decreed. And also the Prophet, Ali salam, he constantly teaches us through his sunnah. Prior to the battle of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, he gave them instructions. The instructions that he gave them were that they are all going to wait for his command until he tells them to do anything, they don't do anything. That's number one. Following the leader and being behind the leader and making sure that you do not do anything without the command. That's number one. And he alayhi salatu salam was reminding them of the reward of Allah that Jannah that Allah has prepared for them. Lifting their spirits because they know there's so many men that they're going to face. He's lifting their spirits that whoever dies amongst you, Allah Taala to promise them paradise. That Allah Taala is going to reward him abundantly. That you are making sacrifice for Allah Taala. Don't take it lightly. Allah Azza will reward you for your patience. Be patient. Fight for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Stand firm, and Allah Azza wa Jal will reward you. And He also gave them instructions to remember Allah Azza wa Jal often, a lot. Why? To, the, to increase their remembrance of Allah Taala before the battle, during the battle, after the battle. Why? Hmm. Any reason why? Why do, why do you guys think the Prophet Allah instructed them to increase the remembrance of Allah Taala? Huh? Now, yeah. 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 it will give you strength. It will give you. It will increase your strength. It will increase you in physical strength, spiritual strength. It will make you one who's stronger. That's exactly what happened. Rather, Allah Taala told us in the surah that's called Surah Al-Anfal. Surah Al-Anfal. What does it talk about? Huh? It, it talks about the spoils of war, but of which war? Which battle? It talks about the battle of Badr, right? Allah Azza wa says in Surah Al-Anfal. يا أيها الذين آمنوا أو أيها البريف إذا لقيتم فئة if you meet the enemy يعني فثبتوا be firm and then Allah said واذكروا الله كثيرا لعلكم تفلحون and remember Allah تبارك وتعالى a lot frequently so that you can attain success that dhikr the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام is instructing them to do it not only grants them strength but it also grants them firmness Thabat, steadfastness, being firm upon what they are upon. Being firm upon the deen of Allah and also being firm in battle. Right? 
And then he also gave them other instructions, the Prophet ﷺ. He told them, if you see Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, don't kill him. Because he was, he came out mukrahan. It is said in some narrations that Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, he had embraced Islam and he was hiding his Islam. And Quraysh forced him to come out. Other narrations say that he wasn't Muslim yet, but he didn't want to fight and he was forced to come out. So the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever sees him, don't harm him. That's number one. Then he said to someone else as well. He said, وَإِذَا لَقِيْتُمْ أَبَ الْبَخْتَرِي فَلَا تَقْتُلُوهُ He said, if you meet and you see Abu al-Bakhtari in the battle, don't kill him, don't harm him. Now this is strange. Why Abu al-Bakhtari? Abu al-Bakhtari is a mushrik. The Prophet ﷺ said, why? He mentioned why. He said, because he did a favor for the Muslims and he never used to harm the Muslims in Mecca. What was the favor he did for the Muslims? He was one of the men who helped end the boycott that was done to the Muslims for three years. He stood up against oppression when all of Quraysh were against him. He was amongst those who helped some of the people of Mecca to help those Muslims who are being starved in the boycott. And he never harmed any of the Muslims in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ never ever forgot a favor that was done for him or for the Muslims. He never forgot it, even if it was done from a non-Muslim. And that's how the Muslim is. He doesn't forget the father, a, a favor someone does for him, or someone who has a favor of him. He never forgets it. So the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, if you see Abu al-Bakhtari, don't harm him. Look at that. He's returning the favor. Because he never harmed the Muslims, we're not going to harm him. The only reason he came out is because Quraysh forced everyone to come. Right? When Quraysh came out, all of their leaders came out. Abu Jahl, Amr ibn Hisham, that's his name. We have Ubay ibn Khalaf, Umayya ibn Khalaf. We have Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. We have Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. All the leaders of Quraysh came out. Umayya ibn Khalaf, he didn't want to come. He didn't want to come to the battle. And he finally tried to find any way to avoid it. But Quraysh forced him to come. They said, if you don't come, then all of Quraysh are going to brand you a coward who was afraid to face his enemies. And if you don't come, when all the other leaders come, you are going to lose your nobility amongst Quraysh. So he came, but he made a deal which you're going to find out about Isha, next time. You also hear about Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was alive at the time, right? Abu Lahab didn't come out to the Battle of Badr. He didn't participate in actually any of the battles of Quraysh because he was a coward. You know what he did? There was a man who was indebted to him. He said, go in my place and I'll forgive you for the debt. That's what he did. And that's how he stayed behind. Because a lot of them were terrified. Why were they terrified? Do you know? Do you remember in Mecca when, they, when the Prophet ﷺ was praying by the Kaaba and they were all sitting down in Nadwa in their parliament and they sent Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt to go harm the Prophet ﷺ while he was in Salah and Sujood. And the Prophet ﷺ after prayer, what did he do? Huh? He made dua against them, didn't he? He made dua against them. He raised his hands. He said, oh, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. He said that three times. And then he made dua against them name by name. He said, Allahumma alayka bi Abi Jahl, wa Umayy ibn Khalaf, wa Uqba ibn Abi Ma'ayt. He mentioned around seven, eight, or nine of them by name. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says. He mentioned them all by name. All those who are mentioned by name, when they heard the Prophet ﷺ say that by the Kaaba, they stopped laughing. The moment he started making dua against them, they stopped, they stopped laughing. Why? Because Quraysh, they believed that any dua that's made by the Kaaba is accepted by Allah. So when he cursed them by name, and they know that the Prophet ﷺ, he's upon the truth as well. They're only denying it because they're arrogant. They got terrified. Okay. There were some people that the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca promised that, he was going, that they were going to die. He promised that they were going to die. Okay? Amongst them is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyat, the one who actually did the action, harmed the Prophet The Prophet promised him he's going to die. That's number one. 
Another person, the Prophet ﷺ didn't only promise him he was going to die, that the Prophet ﷺ told him that I'm going to kill you. You know who that is? Ubay ibn Khalaf. Ubay ibn Khalaf, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, I'm going to kill you. When the Prophet ﷺ said that to him, and the Prophet ﷺ never lied. Hmm? And they know that, he never ever lied. Never made a promise except that he fulfilled his promise, huh? So, Ubay ibn Khalaf didn't want to come to Badr. He didn't want to face the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm going to kill you. He's definitely going to kill him. Do you know that the Prophet ﷺ, all the battles that he participated in, he never killed anyone except that one man, Ubay ibn Khalaf. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ promised that he's going to kill him. He's the only person he killed. Do you know how he killed him? You're going to find next week, inshallah. <laughs> but, the Prophet ﷺ, one may ask, if he was fighting all these battles, how come he only killed one person? Because the Prophet ﷺ, Allah protected him from killing anyone else. He protected him. He used to injure and wound people in battle. But he didn't kill anyone except Ubay ibn Khalaf. And even the way he killed Ubay ibn Khalaf is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. You're going to find it next week. Inshallah. So all of this was part of the preparation for Badr. All the leaders of Quraysh came out except the few that found a way out like Abu Sufyan who was leading the caravan and uh, Abu Lahab who managed to get someone to come in his place and so on. So next week the battle is going to start. How it started, what happened, what were the details, what did the Sama Sahaba do, who did they meet, who was killed, all those details, and, the, and what happened after the battle, and what happened between uh, the battle of Badr, after the battle of Badr, and the battle of Uhud, between that, those, what happened between that, all that, we're going to find out, inshallah ta'ala, in our next lesson. We ask Allah to make us one from those who benefit from what they hear, and we ask Allah to forgive our sins, and we ask Allah to have mercy upon us. We ask Allah Jalla fi ulah to make us from those who hear this speech and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah to make us from those who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. And we ask Allah Jalla fi ulah to guide us and to increase us in guidance and to guide others to us. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us from those who unite with the Prophet and his Sahaba in the highest part of Jannah. And we ask Allah Jalla fi ulah to allow us to reach the blessed month of Ramadan. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to allow us to reach the blessed month of Ramadan. And we ask Allah to make us from those who reach Ramadan in good health and iman and we ask Allah to make us from those who are successful in Ramadan and we ask Allah to make us from those who sincerely repent to Allah and we ask Allah to grant us sincere repentance before we die and we ask Allah to grant us taqwa and to accept our deeds and to grant us sincerity in our statements and actions and we ask Allah Jalla fi ulah to purify our hearts. And we ask Allah to make us from those who act upon their knowledge. And we ask Allah Jalla fi ulah to unite us all in Jannah al Fiddos al A'la with our loved ones and all those who have rights upon us without any previous punishment or any difficult account. Inna huri dhalik al qadir alayh. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak al Nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa alhamdulillah rabbil alayhi. If there are any questions, I will take the question, inshallah. You have a question, huh? What's your question? Uh -huh. You're going to find that out next week, inshallah. Now, now, did Khalid bin Walid participate in the battle of Badr? No, he didn't. That's why they lost. <laughs> because Khalid never participated in the battle except that he won, by the way. Never lost. Even before Islam. Right? Khalid didn't participate in, in Badr because he was absent. He was absent. He wasn't around. But he participated in Uhud and the, the, the Kufar Quraysh won. Yani. Now, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you need to ask them? Okay, the question was that last week we spoke about the ayah of backbiting and the consequences of backbiting. Now, uh, someone that you have backbited, do you need to ask for their forgiveness? And is it sufficient to ask for their forgiveness once or do you have to keep going back and asking them again? 
Um, the answer is, first of all, what is the expiation for backbiting? The ulama, they speak about this. And they say that the one who's backbiting someone, that if it is not going to cause greater harm by him going to the person that he backbited and telling them that I have backbited you, please forgive me, then they should do that. But by them going to that person, if it's going to cause more harm, by them informing them that they, that they have backbited them, what should they do instead? What they should do is that the same gathering that they backbited them, they spoke ill of them, they praised them. And they also make dua for them and seek forgiveness for them in their absence. Right? And also try to do righteous deeds on their behalf, giving sadaqah, whatever, and so on. And inshallah ta'ala, that will help expiate your sin. That's what they mentioned. But if you go ask them to forgive you, right? Asking them once is sufficient, right? And whether they want to forgive you or not, it's up to them as well, right? You're not obliged to forgive you. And that's why these sins that are to do with the rights of the people, they are more dangerous than the sins that are between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. Because Allah Tabarakwat, He'll forgive you if you ask for forgiveness. But a human being may forgive you and he may not forgive you. And that's why it's dangerous. Wallahu alam. Any other questions? No. Because Medina, okay, the question was that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Mecca was more beloved to him and it was the most beloved land to him and if the people didn't exile him, he would never have left. So why is uh, Medina called the city of the Prophet ﷺ? Because Medina was renamed and it was called Yathri previously and it's called Medina Rasulullah because the Prophet ﷺ migrated there and that's where they established the Islamic State and the Prophet ﷺ was the leader there. And also, we mentioned last week that Medina, Yathri, prior to the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, it was not really a city because all the tribes lived by themselves, they lived together. When the Prophet ﷺ came, it became an actual city. Right, so it was called al Medina. now. Yes. The different of? The three different types of adhan. The adhan is only one. You mean the iqam, yani? So, the, like, for example, um, you have, for example, you can say Allah for four times. You're talking about the, okay, term, not al fath you mean the time is standing, the times as you say it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The question was that in some of the madahib, we have that you can say some of the words of the adhan a certain number of times, right? Number of times. The mashhur, what's famous is that the adhan, when you're saying it, you say Allahu Akbar four times at the beginning, Ashadu an la ilaha illa twice, Ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah twice, Hayya ala salah twice, Hayya al falah twice, Allahu Akbar twice, and la ilaha illallah once. That's what's what widespread, and that's the, the riwayah that's mu'tamada, and that's in the sahihin. However, in some of the madhahib like the Malikiya, they have a number of different numbers that they say for a certain part of the adhan. Right? Some parts they say four times, other parts they say another time. Right? And these are athar that are reported from some of the Sahaba. Some of the athar that are reported from some of the Sahaba. But some of the uh, ulama, they mention that these athar, they're not authentic. And some of them, they authenticate them. Or some of them, they make them sound. Therefore, they accept them and they were implemented. And also, it is said that some of the Sahaba actually used to do adhan like that. Right? They used to do adhan like that. That they didn't only narrate it, but used to do adhan like that, and he was learned from them. And that's what Imam Malik, alayhi rahmatullah, he used to do a'timad of Amal Ahl Medina, the actions of, of the people of Medina, where the people of Medina, if they did something, he would see it as evidence, whereas others did not did not see it as evidence because they have a clearly why that's authentic, which states that the adhan was done in a certain way. Wallahu ta'ala alam. As for the iqamah, the iqamah has two main ways of it being said. One way is that it's exactly like the adhan, and you only add qatqama to salah. And the other is that you say each part of the iqam, Allahu Akbar, you say it twice instead of four times. Ashadu an la ilaha illa once, Ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah once, Hayya ala salah once, Hayya ala fila once. Then qatqama to salah twice, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar twice, la ilaha illa Allah. Right? But the second one is reported in the Tirmidhi, and the first one is reported in Sahihain. They both have يعني, a hadith and they're both okay, Wallahu alam. Now, yes. A few questions, Allahu Akbar. For restrictions. So, for example, like when the prayer was made compulsory, the companions who had already migrated to Medina, or was that done after the prayer was made compulsory? 
He was done after the Salah was made compulsory. So the Salah when it's made compulsory, actually forget when the Salah was made compulsory. Salah was legislated way before it was made compulsory. Salah was legislated at the beginning of Revelation. When the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first read you know the first thing that Jibreel Alayhi Salaam taught him? Al-Wudu and Salah. How to perform Wudu and how to perform the Salah. At that time, Salah was just two rak'ahs, right? And then what happened? Salah was made obligatory as five prayers, right? So those five prayers, all of them were two rak'ahs except Maghrib, which was three. That was the beginning how they prayed, the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ. When they came to Medina, they also prayed like that at the beginning. Until then, Wahi came down to the Prophet ﷺ, which told him that Dhuhr, Asr, Isha are now four rak'ahs. So then the Prophet ﷺ taught all the Sahaba and they all implemented that immediately because everything spread. Now. The Medina people, when the Prophet ﷺ came there, he taught them everything they need to know. Khalas. And the Sahaba who came, who migrated from Mecca as well. Nah. The other question was, who was the person who advised the Prophet ﷺ? Who's the person? His name is, uh, his name is not mentioned. I, th I think somebody wanted to mention it, but I don't recall at the moment. I'll find out, inshallah. Ah, so Quraysh, what was the problem that the Prophet he, he, that they had, that the Prophet came to fix? Quraysh, they believed in Allah. They believed in Tawheed al rububiyyah the Tawheed of Lordship. They believed that Allah is the creator, the sustainer. And they attribute to all these actions that only Allah can do. They singled out Allah Azza wa in that. And they believed in that. Because Allah says, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say Allah. So what was the problem? The problem was that they would say, we need to worship these idols to get to Allah. They are the middlemen between us and Allah. So the problem was to hid al worshipping Allah, singing Allah out in worship, worshipping Allah alone. That was the problem. They associate partners with Allah. Even though they believe there's only one God and that can do all this, right? Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ was told, just like all the other messengers before him, Allah worship Allah and don't associate any parts with him. And that's what they refused. They said, Did he make all the gods one God? That's a strange matter. They said they refused it. Now. Any other questions? How do we reconcile between the ishtihad of the Prophet ﷺ and the statement of Allah Taala in huwa illa wahyu hadat Allah says that the statement of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu it is wahyun yuha it is revelation the hadith of the Prophet Ali is revelation because the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam between the two the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when something was wahi he made it very clear to the Sahaba and when something was ishtihad from himself he also made it clear he clarified it just like we mentioned now the example in Badr. When the Sahabi asked him, he said, Ya Rasulullah, is this wahi or is it ishtihad from you? Right? And he said, it's ishtihad from me. But the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, they only asked questions like that when there was a need to do so. Otherwise, everything the Prophet did, alayhi salatu salam, and everything he said, they took it as wahi. By default. They didn't need a reason from the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam. But the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he differentiates. And that's what we learned from the Sunnah. And the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, we see that... He alayhi salatu salam would say that Jibreel alayhi salam came to me and informed me of this and this and this. He would say that I received this. I was informed of this. Allah tabarak commands you. The wording that the Prophet alayhi salam is using, it indicates his wahi. You see? No, but the Prophet alayhi salam did do ishtihad. He did do ishtihad. His wording says that he did ishtihad. He said, لَوْلَا أَنَا شُقَّ عَلَى أُمَّتِي if I did not want to make it difficult for my ummah, I would have commanded them to use siwak before every prayer. That shows and affirms that the Prophet ﷺ had ishtihad. Right? It affirms that the Prophet ﷺ had ishtihad and he used that ishtihad. Alayhi salatu salam. And his ishtihad, he would do it and if he was wrong, Allah would correct him. Like at the end of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ did ishtihad and he took asra, prisoners of war. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says in 
the Quran, it's not befitting. Ma kalin it's not befitting for the Prophet. And yakun al asra, for him to have prisoners. Right? So if he made a mistake with his jihad, Allah corrected it, then it became wahi. You see? Allah wa Wayakum, the khalas, that will stop there, inshallah ta'ala, as it's getting late. We will conclude, inshallah ta'ala, subhanakallah, hamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiraka, tubu ilayk. Next lesson, by the way, next lesson, uh, before uh, we end, next lesson is the last class we have before Ramadan, right? It's the last class we have before Ramadan. So initially, let me tell you what was in my mind before we started this class. Initially, what I wanted to do was, I wanted to finish the whole Medini, Medini period in these four weeks before Ramadan. But then, I changed my mind. And the reason why, you can tell that we know we're near finishing Medina period, right? We're just at the beginning. The reason why I change my mind is because the Medina period has a lot of incidents that happened and a lot of details that perhaps if we went through it that quickly, as quick as the Meccan period we did prior to the break, we wouldn't benefit from it as much. Therefore, I decided to take my time with the Medina period and extract more benefits from it that we can apply to our lives so that we go away with more benefits. Therefore, next week is going to be the last lesson before we start Ramadan. And when Ramadan starts, we have the option to continue our class or to stop for Ramadan. And in Ramadan, we're probably going to have a different lesson. And then after Ramadan, we continue the seerah. Uh, and I'm going to ask you guys to vote right now. You're going to raise your hands, huh? So, who says that we should continue? Of course, the time is going to change. It won't be the evening now because we're going to have Taraweeh and all that stuff having in the evening. So the time will change, it'll probably be around the Asr time, early on the day, yani. Who says that we should continue the Seerah class in Ramadan? On, Sunday. on Sundays. Same day, but it'll be Asr time, so it'll be like 5 p.m. Asr. Who says that? Raise your hand. Taif, uh, let's count. One, I want to be fair. One, someone count for me, everyone. <laughs> Is that going to change the way you vote, huh? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I was, I, was asked, I was asked to mention what is the other option That's good, that might happen. Right? So we know what we're voting for, huh? <laughs> the other option, it is that in the, the, the first uh, few weeks of Ramadan, the first few Sundays that I'm here because I'll be traveling at the end, uh, that we have tafsir of some of the Quran, right? So the other option, because Ramadan is the Shahar of Quran, Quran, that we have to hear of some of the ayat of the Quran and some of the surah of the Quran, or we carry on the seerah. Now let's vote again. Those who say carry on seerah, raise your hands. Ajib, that all changed your minds, huh? So I'm guessing we're going to stop seerah and continue seerah after Ramadan, huh? And we do to seerah some of the ayat of the Quran and some of the surah. Jameel, khalas, hakada, tafakna. So next week will be the last class before we continue after Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. Next week we're going to talk about the Battle of Badr and what happened in the Battle of Badr. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to try to uh, explain it as if you can see it. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to talk about what happened after the Battle of Badr and then we'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala. And then after Ramadan, we'll continue from the Battle of Uhud in the third year after Hijrah. Hada wallahu ala wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad.
Thank <laughs> you. 